I've got a nice integral for you guys today. But before we look at that integral, I want to point out that I'm in my half-finished new studio. So you can probably notice that it's a little echoey, but once it's all the way finished, it'll be nicely sound treated and stuff. And that's maybe like a few weeks away, so maybe two or two and a half weeks away. And one of the first things that I want to do in my new studio is do an endurance live stream where I teach an entire Calculus 2 class, sometimes also known as integral calculus class, without stopping from the beginning to the end. So that's a full semester's worth of material without stopping. So I think that'll be pretty fun to do. And in fact, my research from students from the summer or from this summer are gonna help me out by maybe being in, in the chat and also like ordering me food and stuff. And maybe they'll also make some surprise appearances. Okay, so if you haven't done so yet, maybe subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss this kind of like fun thing that I'm gonna do in a couple of weeks. Okay, so let's look at our goal. We wanna evaluate the integral from zero to one of the natural log of x times arc sine of x. And by arc sine, I mean the inverse of the sine function. Now, before we get started looking at these tools, I wanna to point out that here we have an inverse function. Natural log is the inverse of the exponential function times another inverse function. And generally when we have integrals involving inverse functions, you wanna use integration by parts. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. And that actually leads us to the following two tools that we'll use. The first of which is the antiderivative of arc sine. So let's maybe go ahead and make this calculation. Then we'll move on to the second, and then we can all put it together into our main goal. Okay, so let's look at this. We wanna find the antiderivative of the arc sine, in other words, the inverse sine of x. And so this is an inverse function in its own right, and so we'll use the standard integration by parts trick in order to evaluate this. And that is we wanna set the function itself equal to u, and then dx will play the role as of dv. And the motivation here is that the antiderivative of an inverse function is hard to find, but the derivative is usually well known. So from this setup, we know that du is the derivative of arc sine, which is one over the square root of one minus x squared dx. So that's a standard derivative relationship. Next, we know since dv is dx, v is equal to x. Then finally, we'll use our standard integration by parts formula, which says the integral u dv, is equal to uv minus integral v du. That allows us to write this as, well, u times v, so that'll be x times arc sine of x. So we've got x arc sine of x minus the integral of v du, so that's gonna be x over the square root of one minus x squared dx. Now we've just got that leftover integral to calculate, and we can do that via a substitution. So let's say maybe t is equal to one minus x squared. That means dt is equal to minus two x dx. And under this setup, we can see that all of this stuff under the radical is t, and then this x times dx can be gobbled up by the dt. In fact, it is minus one half times dt, just by solving that equation. So let's see what that leaves us, with, leaves us with. We have x arc sine of x minus negative one half, so that's gonna be plus one half. And then we have the antiderivative of one over the square root of t, but that's t to the minus half dt. But now we can use the power rule on that. So using the power rule, we will increase the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent. So that's gonna become t to the half divided by half, which is the same thing as multiplying by two. So now we can see that this two and this two cancel. And then we can substitute back in for x, leaving us with x arc sine of x plus t to the half, but that's one minus x squared, and I'm gonna write that as the square root of one minus x squared. Now, of course, we have a constant of integration, but since our final goal is a definite integral, we won't worry about that. Okay, so we've just established this first tool. Okay, now we're ready to look at this second tool, and that is the antiderivative of 
the square root of one minus x squared over x. We're gonna establish this formula for that antiderivative. So let's get to it. We have the antiderivative, like I said, one minus x squared under the square root over x dx. Now there are several ways to do this. I'm just gonna choose trig substitution, not because it's the easiest, but just so that we see a variety of methods in this video, so it's a nice review. So the standard trig substitution setup here will be to let x equal sine theta. That's because we have something like the square root of one minus x squared. So that means that dx is equal to cos theta. And then furthermore, that means that the square root of one minus x squared is also equal to cosine theta using the Pythagorean identity. So let's see what that does to our integral. So that changes this integral into, well, let's see what we've got. We've got sine theta in the denominator, cosine times cosine in the numerator. So we have cos squared theta over sine theta d theta. Now I'm sure there are several ways that you can go from here, but what I'd like to do is use the Pythagorean identity on the cosine squared to write it as one minus sine squared and then see what we can get out of that. So writing that as one minus sine squared, we will be left with the antiderivative of one over sine theta. So that's from this one minus sine squared over sine, but that's gonna be minus sine theta d theta. Next, we'll recall that one over sine theta is the same thing as cosecant theta. And now that has a fairly tricky antiderivative, but generally you can look it up in a table or this is often like taught at the end of a calculus one class. So I'll let you guys remind yourselves how to find the antiderivative of cosecant and we'll just jump to what it is. So this is gonna be minus the natural log of the absolute value of cosecant theta plus cotangent theta. And then we have minus the antiderivative of sine, but the antiderivative of sine is minus cosine, so that's gonna cancel that minus sine to a plus. Next, I'll notice that cosine is the same thing as the square root of one minus x squared. I'll move that out front one minus x squared under the square root, and then we have minus the natural log of this stuff. So that's gonna be the natural log of the absolute value of cosecant. Notice that cosecant is one over sine, that's gonna give us one over x, given this, plus cotangent. Cotangent is cosine over sine, so that's gonna be square root of one minus x squared over x. So there I've just matched this cosecant with this and this cotangent with this, given the fact that cosecant is one over sine and cotangent is cosine theta over sine theta. But now putting those two things that are in the absolute values together, we see that we have achieved this second formula. And now we're ready to attack our main goal. So we're gonna attack this main goal using integration by parts again. So what I'll do is I'll set this natural log of x equal to u, and then arc sine of x dx equal to dv. Then taking the derivative of u, that tells us that du is one over x dx. Derivative of log is one over x. Then taking the antiderivative of arc sine, well, we've gotta use that formula right there. So that's gonna give us v is equal to x, arc sine of x plus root one minus x squared. So plugging these parts into the integration by parts formula will give us the following. So we'll have u times v, so that's u times v, x, natural log of x, arc sine of x, plus natural log of x, times the square root of one minus x squared. And I should point out that this needs to be evaluated from x equals zero to x equals one. Okay, and then next we have minus the integral of v du. So let's see what that is. That's gonna be minus the integral from zero to one of v. So that'll be x times one over x arc sine of x. So that's gonna give us arc sine of x. And then this square root of one minus x squared over x as well. So plus radical one over x squared 
over x dx. But now we know the antiderivative of both of these parts from our tool. So the antiderivative of the arc sine portion is going to be x arc sine of x and then plus radical 1 minus x squared and then the antiderivative of that kind of radical rational expression will be this kind of object right here. So that'll be plus the square root of 1 minus x squared minus the natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus the square root of 1 minus x squared over x. So just to reiterate, we have all of this minus all of this where we need to evaluate this from x equals 0 to x equals 1 as well. And while we're at it, let's maybe add these two together into a 2 times that square root. Okay, let's maybe make those simplifications and then start off at the top of the board. So I cleaned everything up and put it at the top of the board. Now we're ready to put the bounds in. So let's first start putting x equals 1 into all of the parts here. So I'll maybe just like circle this x equals 1 in pink and I'll use that color coding to notate what's happening here. So if I plug x equal 1 in here, I get 1 times natural log of 1, which is 0, times arc sine of 1, which is pi over 2, but that 0 means that this all goes to 0 if we're setting x equal to 1. Then the same thing happens here. I get natural log of 1 times the square root of 0, but that's 0 regardless. So we get this all goes to 0 as well as we set x equal to 1. If we put x equal to 1 here, we're going to get minus 1 times arc sine of 1, so that's going to be minus pi halves. So that's what we get from that term. Plugging x equal 1 here, we'll see that that obviously goes off to 0, so there's no worries there. Finally, plugging x equal to 1 down here, we'll see that we get the natural log of 1, which is 0 again. So plugging in x equals 1, we see that we get one non-zero term, which is this guy right here, this minus pi halves. Okay, so now let's see what happens as we plug in x equals 0. So some of these terms will be problematic and some will not. So notice if we set x equal to 0 here, we just get 0 times 0. Well, that's going to be 0. No worries. If we plug x equals 0 here, well, we're going to get 1 minus 0. Take the square root, you get 1. But that's going to give us a minus 2. But then since it's the lower bound, we'll get a 2. But then all of the rest of those are problematic when we plug in 0. So notice here, we'll get 0 times 0 times natural log of 0 tends to negative infinity. So that's a problem. Again, natural log of 0 tends to negative infinity. That's a problem. And here we've got the natural log of something that looks like 2 over 0. That's also a problem. So let's maybe spell all of that out. So we get this 2 minus pi over 2. So that's all of the good parts. And all of the parts that aren't good, which I'll underline in green, can be sorted out with a limit. So since that's the lower bound of integration, I need to take the limit as x goes to 0, and it's attached to a minus sign, of all of these things right here. So I'll have x, natural log of x, arc sine of x, and then plus natural log of x times the square root of 1 minus x squared, and then finally plus the natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus the square root of 1 minus x squared all over x. Great. So now this one is not actually super problematic. We can think about these two functions together. Those are both tending off towards zero. And then this natural log of x is tending off towards infinity. So we might as well think about this as x arc sine of x over 1 over the natural log of x. And now this is an indeterminate form of type. Let's see, 0 over 0. Now a quick application of L'Hopital's rule will show that all of this trends off towards 0. So that just means that we need to worry about the rest of the part. So let's copy that back down. Okay, so just to reiterate where we are, we have 2 minus pi over 2 minus this limit, which looks pretty tricky. Let's see what type of limit it is. 
So as x goes to zero, this goes to one, this goes to minus infinity. So that's gonna be minus infinity. And then this goes to two in the numerator and zero in the denominator, but that means we have natural log of something that's going to positive infinity. So that's gonna be plus infinity. So we've got this indeterminate form of type infinity minus infinity. So that means we should probably try to combine those together some way. Maybe the thing that I wanna do is notice that I can take this and rewrite it as a difference of logarithms using some log rules. So this is gonna be the natural log of one plus the square root of one minus x squared minus the natural log of x. But that's gonna be super helpful because this natural log of one plus the square root of one minus x squared is well behaved. And then the part that is not well behaved is connected to a natural log of x term. So let's see what we can get from that. Well, again, letting x tend towards zero, we'll get natural log of two here. So that leaves us with two minus pi halves minus natural log of two minus this limit as x goes to zero from above of the natural log of x times negative one plus the square root of one minus x squared. And we still have an indeterminate form, but it is a bit nicer. Notice that this trends off to negative infinity and this bit trends off towards zero. So let's maybe do a couple of things. I'll take this minus sign, change it to a plus by changing the signs in here. Then I'll bring that to the top and we're almost done. So on the last board, we got everything down to this spot. So our goal integral is equal to two minus pi over two minus natural log of two plus this limit as x goes to zero of natural log of x times one minus the square root of one minus x squared. We noticed that this was type infinity times zero. So we would like to somehow manipulate it so that it is a indeterminate form that we can apply L'Hopital's rule to. And we can do that by multiplying this by the radical conjugate. So I'll multiply by one plus the square root of one minus x squared in the numerator and the denominator. Let's see what simplifying effect that has. So now I'll just focus on this bit right here for now. So that's gonna be equal to this limit as x goes to zero from above, I have my natural log of x times one minus one minus x squared. So that's just using a difference of squares formula. And then in the denominator, I have one plus the square root of one minus x squared. Then let's notice that this numerator simplifies quite a bit. It simplifies just to x squared. So now I've got this limit as x goes to zero from above of x squared times natural log of x over one plus the square root of one minus x squared. But now I wanna notice that as x goes to zero, this denominator is well behaved we can see that it is going to approach two. So all we really need to worry about is what is happening to this x squared natural log of x. I can write this as a half where I brought this two out and then the limit as x goes to zero from above of natural log of x in the numerator and x to the minus two in the denominator. And now it's a standard indeterminate form type infinity over infinity. I can apply, I can apply L'Hopital's rule by taking the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator to see that that simplifies down to a fairly simple limit, which clearly trends off to zero because in fact, I have something on the order of X squared. So that means all of this stuff cancels down to zero, leaving us with our final solution, two minus pi over two minus natural log of two. And that's a good place to stop the right and it's attack. <laughs>